my name is Lisa Hayward and I'd like to welcome you to Callers Chat, an online space that I've created for callers to come together and chat about all things calling. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome to our stage, Tom Kitching. Tom is an excellent dance musician and has been for many years. I first met him when I was calling and he was playing fiddle in the band. But since then, he's added another string to his bow, pun very much intended, and he started calling himself as well. So tonight, I'm really interested to hear what he has to say about calling from a musician's perspective. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Tom. Hello. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm excited about this. I'm a little apprehensive to see what happens. I'm really fascinated to see the people have come along. And I, there's a really wide range of different backgrounds in, in calling and dance here, which is really great. And um so what's my background? Yeah, I, I'm a musician, first and foremost. I've been playing for dance for about 20 years. And calling really happened to me by mistake. So I found myself on a couple of occasions, a caller was needed. And I realized after so many years of playing for dance that a lot of it had really sunk in. And I'm really, I suppose, in that sense, indebted to those callers who went into more depth to explain what they were doing and what they really wanted from the musicians as they were doing it which really leads into the, the topic we've got this time, which is um, calling from a musician's perspective. And so I had, as I became a caller, I realized I had already a great sense, I hope, of, of what dances really needed, more than just, oh, it needs a jig, a, a real sense of exactly what the dance is looking for in terms of a real feel, a pace, um, an emphasis, and how to relate those tunes to the dances. So it's, a, yeah, it's a, definitely a passion of mine, and I still move very freely between both roles, and I always take my fiddle along to any gig that I'm calling and um, and try and steal as many dances as possible off all the wonderful colours I get to work with. So the majority of my calling experience, I should say, is Kayleigh's, um, especially parties and weddings. I've got a bit more in the way of doing festivals in recent years. Um, but my playing experience is definitely very, very much broader. It includes a great deal of social dance experience, especially uh, with reference to Playford uh, and similar styles. So I've done a, a lot of that and I particularly enjoy playing uh, for Playford dancing. So as I was writing this talk, it really I realised quite quickly that as I could see it, it really divides into two very um, different halves, which is the first half is if as a caller you're working with musicians who, how I might say, don't entirely get it. And the second half might be working with musicians who really do. Uh, and perhaps the link would be how to um, sort of create that inclusive environment to help as many musicians as possible get from group one to group two over time. Because I know I definitely started in group one. We all do. You know, when you start off playing for dance, you don't really know what you're doing. And as I said, I'm very, very grateful to particularly those callers who weren't just working with the dancers, but were working with me as a musician and other musicians like me to help me really understand what they were doing and what really made for good danceable music and helped me make that sort of movement through to I would like to think of a reasonable dance musician. But let's talk about working with musicians who, who don't entirely get it and I think this is it's a funny thing about dance calling is that the lower on the ladder you are the harder life is I think and um, if you you're more likely to encounter bands that don't really quite get what they're doing if you're on the agency caller circuit as I am a lot of the time or you're working with sort of amateur or semi-professional bands um, it's a school of hard knocks. You learn the hard way. You're invariably dealing with really drunk people at weddings who've never, ever done it before. And then um, as time goes by, I remember when I did my first festival, Kaylee, and everybody knew what they were doing and the band were really good. And I was, I was very apprehensive and nervous about it beforehand. And as I was calling it, I thought, this is easy in comparison to what I normally do. So we've all got, I think, for bands at some point who don't seem to entirely get or even care about what's being asked of them. And they may know what a jig of a reel is or such like, but they don't really understand what a request for them means in real terms when it comes to um, really engaging with the dance and what the dancers on the floor want to do. Uh, some bands just it seems to me don't even care. And it can be a job to get them to engage with the idea that just starting some jigs and stopping at an agreed point isn't quite enough. Um, firstly, I'd say identifying the specific limitations of the band as early as as possible is key, preferably in a way that doesn't make them feel bad about themselves. Um, I would divide these limitations perhaps into three categories. And uh, the first category is um, those who are perhaps just not very experienced yet, but keen to learn. And I, I've been there. That's how we all start. The folk scene is wonderful like that. You can just get involved. You can find yourself in a Kaylee band. And next thing you know, you're playing a Kaylee and you haven't got a clue. Um, but that's, that's a, the most important group to work with, because I think most of us here will have come out of that kind of background. 
I think there's a second group where, where you get these, uh, uh, it really annoys me, but you get these very decent musicians, very good players quite often, but they don't really care about relating to the dance. They've got a caller to do that. They just want to play tunes, get paid and go home. And I have encountered altogether too much of that over the years. Um, and then like the third category, and perhaps this is slightly uncharitable, so I definitely won't be naming names, but like they're not very good, but they think they are good. And I would say perhaps they've been doing it for 50, being doing it for 50 years is sadly not always a synonym for quality. We'll start off with a not very good, not very experienced, but keen to learn. I say this is where I started. I've got great sympathy for this. Um, and if you're a band working with a band that's inexperienced but keen to learn, it could be a constructive process helping them link the music better to the dances. And I'm always happy to briefly have a chat about what would work well in the music for each dance. And I would pick out key moves within it and illustrate how um, the tempo will help or hinder them. I always take a moment to say, well, could you just play me a bit of the, the tune that we that you're proposing so I can have a listen to it and decide if it fits. But I would say working with an inexperienced band, by far the most important thing is to work on pacing. That's where it goes wrong far more often than anything else is getting the pace right. And I frequently find that many bands have actually very little idea about pacing for dances at all. And given that all time signatures represent actually a very broad belt of possible tempos, it's vital to express a clear idea of what your chosen time signature actually means. And you know, we've all had um, reels that have gone slower than a slow English polka and jig so fast that there's no hope for anybody. Um, for many lower level musicians and even some higher ones, and even if they can dance a bit themselves, the natural understanding of how to play the music so that it really fits just isn't there. And so you do need to do a bit of work to get them ballpark. And it's, I, I find a lot of people can't think music and feet at the same time, that they become two very different disciplines and helping them merge is one of the key things that you can do to work with a band that haven't got a great deal of experience. I'd say sometimes though, it's just really hard. I worked with a community dance band at a folk festival last summer and try as they might, they just physically weren't able to play a lot of their tunes at dancing speed. And so there was a lot of space in the dances and I had to introduce a lot of extra swings and things to make it fit. Um, that can happen. But I've also encountered some top musicians in highly respected bands but it turns out I've absolutely no idea how the music they're playing relates to the dance being called. On one occasion, I was working with a very famous Cayley band, and I'm not going to name anyone unless I've got something positive to say, so I'll be anonymous. But I was at Warwick Festival, and I was calling Old Swan Gallop, which is usually done to jigs. It works perfectly well with reels. It's fine. Um, and the band just decided to play a brand new set of three two hornpipes without telling me, and... I had to wing it very, very quickly. And this is one of the top bands, at the absolute top of the Cayley scene. I had no clue that there might be an issue with that. And winging it very quickly, I soon realised if I just cut each move to six steps, it would work perfectly well. And it did, and we got away with it. But I've never had to think on my feet quite as fast as that. But it just goes to show that even bands that are very, very highly regarded quite often don't really get it. Um, so you get these uh, decent musicians also who, but they just don't care. They want to play the tunes, get paid and go home. And I do encounter a lot of that, particularly on the circuit where I do a lot of work as a caller, which is agency circuit. And you get this band that don't care about the dancing. They just want to play their favorite tunes, get paid and go home. You can't really easily address a shortage of enthusiasm for the dancers if people are being cynical about it. And although it's frustrating, the most important thing is to do what you can to finesse their playing and your choice of dancers to match the evening. When I've selected a dance, I won't just ask the band for tunes of the right time and signature. I'm trying to talk to whoever is the band leader about the, how the rhythm needs to feel. And if, I'm, if it's, for example, jigs, I'll try and explain the feel using musical terms rather than dancing terms. The dancing terms may not hit. So I might say something like energetic, bouncy or floaty or dreamy and try and give a sense of the rhythm. Um, if the rhythm ends up being too fast or slow during the dance, I try and catch it as early as possible so that the adjustment can be made as early in the set as possible. Um, oh, and if the band has a drummer, give them the tempo you want, not the lead instrumentalist. <laughs> um, yeah, the third category, you do get um, uh, the bands that, that think they're really good when they're not. Um, and that can be very, very hard because they're not going to listen. Um, and it can it, they're generally a bunch of older players who've been doing it for 50 years. And that's not me having to go older players who've been doing it for 50 years because some of our finest bands definitely fit that. But sometimes you do meet um, bands who've just been doing the same set exactly the same way for 50 years. They're going to play the tunes they've always played at the speed they always play it, and you can't influence that. So you just have to make what you're doing fit what they do. So I call dancers with plenty of recovery figures until I figure out exactly how it's going to go. Um, 
with all these groups, I would say introductions are a really big part of it. Um, a lot of bands really struggle with introductions to give a, a clear introduction and don't necessarily understand the value of doing so. Um, so you want to talk to them in advance of um, the concert to say, what sort of introductions are you likely to give? Help them select an, a style of introduction if necessary. Uh, make them promise to be consistent or at least tell you if it's going to vary. Uh, I do struggle sometimes. A lot of bands where you get instrumentalists who play very flat, they don't, if you've got a rhythm section in a band, the instrumentalist will sometimes play quite flat. And so the, in the introduction comes, and if it's a tune I'm unfamiliar with, I can't hear where the bar lines are and I don't quite know where to begin. So that's an area I really struggle with. And perhaps a bit of, a, if anyone later on has a bit of advice for how to really dial into that or help a, an inexperienced band really put the rhythm into an introduction, that's a, an area I do struggle with as a caller. But let's flip over. This is the, the more fun and important part of it. Working with a band who really get it. And this is where things can be really, really good fun. And, and just getting the right communication can be the difference between a good gig and a great gig. And I'm going to flip the perspective here. I've spoken from the point of view of being a caller so far. But I'm going to flip the perspective here and put myself in the band for the majority of the next bit. And I thought about it from the point of view of what were the things that stopped a good gig being a great gig? And, and how easy would they be to address? And what little bits of back and forth knowledge would be really good? When I say a band that gets it, I don't necessarily mean top link musicians. That's not what it's about. I think it's musicians who follow the feet, who take an interest in wanting to make it work. And if they need enough competence to play with control and feel, but the biggest single factor to a band being decent to play for dancing, in my view, is whether they've got an interest in making the music fit the dancers, a kind of a fascination in how it works. That's what did it for me when I started playing for Kaylee. I was really interested in, in what I could do with my instrument, what I could do with the fiddle to work with the shape of the dance to put lift in the right places and experiment with it and I was lucky that I had the right people around me to um, help me understand that working with callers like Rodri Davis from a, a very early point and um, I would play music in my band with a melodeon player called Howard Jones who's just got the most beautiful uplifting danceable style and just to absorb that and see how that worked and watch the feet was really key to me. So I've sequenced it, um, starting with before the gig uh, through to the end of the gig and beyond. So thinking before the gig, I always request a, a band's tune list for a gig if I'm calling. And likewise, I'll send one out if I'm playing. I think make contact really early. So much of what I'm going to say about this, I, I would hope it's all very, very um, obvious. It's um, common sense. And, and a lot of people here will be doing pretty much all of this already. But if everybody came away with one new idea from somewhere in it, that would be fantastic. But yeah, always exchange set lists. Um, and if a band, uh, when I'm in a band, if a caller says, what's your favourite couple of sets to play? We love that. Um, so always ask a band what they really want to do and um, have a listen to it and work out what's going to fit that. Because a band want to play their favourite sets, not just some stuff that's going to fit all night. So um, always make sure the band have played their favourite two or three things. If you, uh, as a band, are running PA, which you usually will be, the band are going to provide PA in the vast majority of situations away from the festival circuit. Um, let's get a chat going between the band and caller about tech. What microphone is the caller using would be something I'd want to ask. Um, do they call from the stage? Do they have a headset? And do they head out into the crowd? I think it's important that they have an un both sides, that whoever's providing the PA, let's assume it's a band because it mostly will be, the band and the caller have the same expectation of the equipment to be used and who is responsible for providing it. I've had situations where callers have turned up with gear that would fail a pat test. Um, pat test? That's it. That's a tautology. A, peer, a portable appliance test. Um, because they quite often bodge things on that will um, cut out the earth wire. So make sure your equipment is, is definitely going to work. It will place the band in a very difficult position if I have to say, you actually can't use that because I'm the one that's done the risk assessment for this gig in this room and that's not right so yeah do have a look at your gear we, sometimes people say oh i've been using this radio set for 40 years and there's never been a problem when well actually there is um and you can have that radio equipment can clash as well if you're using radio mics particularly older stuff it's on very limited channels i remember one very famous gig we were doing uh, in stockport and the caller turned up with a radio mic that as it happened worked on the same frequency um, that they were using for the Catholic mass that was going on next door. So partway through, not only did we get Latin in the middle of this Kaylee, but I do believe in the Catholic mass, they suddenly got, okay, it's audience participation time. Please bring a partner out to the front. Now, it really doesn't matter what gender they are. 
which uh, I believe went down very, very well. A um, little piece of advice just in general when using radio equipment, if there are problems with it, look for a T-loop in the building. That can really knacker a lot of radio equipment working properly if the T-loop is turned on. That's just a general piece of advice. Still before the gig, um, if you as a caller have any unusual requests, now is the time to ask. I play a lot for social dance uh, where the dances are often matched to specific and uh, um, uh, um, specific tunes. And as I'm one of uh, at least two non-sight readers in the band, we need plenty of time to prep up the material. And frankly, even if you've got sight readers, you still need that. It, it's better just not to plonk a pile of music in front of a band and press play. This doesn't lead to very danceable music because even if the band can sight read to a, a very high level, um, they won't be able to sight feel it, if I might put it like that. The music will be stiff. If your eyes are glued to a sheet of paper, you're by definition not looking at the feet. And that's where the musicality and the danceability comes from. That's where you get that feedback loop of, as a musician, you're being influenced by the flow of the dancers and where the dancers are being influenced by the push and pull that you're putting into it. And you can't do that if you're looking at notes. So notes are fine as an aid memoir. I'm not against that in the slightest, but I think sight reading for a dance is to be avoided at all costs and get any specific repertoire you want out as early as possible, particularly to a band that want to put arrangement in and want to really learn that. Um, and again, if I'd just been sight reading, I doubt I would have made that transition to being a caller because it's that constant switched on to what's going on on the dance floor and understanding how that music really fits it that kind of showed me the way to, to make that change. OK, getting to set up and sound check. Um, some callers are very gently spoken in sound check and then suddenly increase volume massively as soon as you put 100 dancers in front of them and get the band playing. So. As a caller, be sure to sound check with the exact enthusiasm of volume that you're going to call with. Simulate the voice you will use when the adrenaline is flowing. Happy, enthusiastic caller voice. So really push it out so that whoever's doing the PA, and it will almost always be the, the band, who aren't necessarily going to be in a position to change it later when the dance has begun, are going to hear you as you are when you're calling the gig. It's natural to get louder and louder if you can't hear yourself. So think about monitoring. Um, so many callers don't think about monitoring. Uh, and from the band's perspective, it would be really helpful if they did. Um, there's many solutions to it, and I, I know it all gets a bit techy, but if anyone wants to have a chat about it afterwards, drop me an email. I'll, I'll do my best to explain. But just get a, something as simple as a floor wedge in front of you where some of your own voice can be fed back to you so that you don't feel like you're having a shout. Just being able to hear yourself, you won't have, when you're on the microphone, much of a perspective in many of these places as to quite what you sound like out front. So just having some of that sound coming back to you from a little speaker in front of you can make a big difference. You can do the same thing by putting an inline monitor. You can get a helicons with a thing a few years ago, but there'll be others now where the, the order of se the sequence of events is slightly different where you have a, a, a microphone, then a monitor that it goes through before sending signal onto the desk. So you're completely in control of it. Just a bit of your voice. These things often build into a microphone stand, so they can be at sort of chest level. It's pointing up, but you're giving you a little bit of your voice back so you don't feel the need to shout and your um, volume is going to be consistent. And there's in-ear versions as well. In-ear technology is getting really good now. I need to experiment with it more myself, but um, in-ear fallback is becoming really, really good and probably the way we'll all be going in a few years. I would say also, um, understand a bit about EQ. Uh, everybody's got a different voice and every band has different natural sorts of sounds that they make. And my voice, for example, usually needs a bit of bass rolling off and some treble adding in, by which I mean, my voice is a big range of tones, a big range of frequencies from high to low, as they all are. But mine is perhaps a little bit biased towards below the middle and if we take a bit of that out and we put a bit more of the, if we boost the higher frequencies, it ends up sounding perhaps a little bit like a train station announcement or a bit mobile phony. But that's good uh, for a lot of bands because that's going to sit in a natural gap where there are not very many instruments. So picking a way of EQing your voice by changing the, the bass or the treble or different frequencies so that it's not interfering with one of the main melody instruments. Again, it's a simple mistake that um, a lot of bands and callers get wrong that I think is really worth looking at, making sure that your voice sits in a hole in the music. And it will be different for every band, but there aren't that many instruments in the sort of high middly range where you can go. That sort of phone or tannoy kind of voice Sounds a bit weird if you just listen to it by itself, but when you mix it in with the other instruments, it sounds really good. Okay, um, upon sound checking, um, as a caller, go out and listen to the band, and then get one of them to go out and listen to you calling over the top of the band. Pretty obvious stuff, but it's worth doing. Um, 
talking about the performance itself, um, sometimes the dance is going to slip out of time um, and you might need, or well, it might be a good idea to add another eight bars of music at some point. Just decide in advance whose job it is to call for that. Because if the caller decides to cut a move, but the band have just added eight bars, you haven't really helped. So just have that discussion in advance between the band um, and the caller as to whose responsibility it is to get things back in time if eight bars is going to help somewhere. Um, during the performance, let the band know how many times you're going to do the dance. And if that's likely to be a flexible number, um, let the band know that it's going to be flexible. And as soon as you know how many are left, say so. Most bands give the tunes a lot of shape, building up to some sort of ending. So try not to surprise them with a sudden request to stop. One caller I used to work with would simply wave a beer towel very vigorously from the floor during the last eight bars, which gave no opportunity to shape a satisfying ending. So um, do let the band know with plenty of time. Two times two is really nice if you can do that. It gives it time to give it a bit of build and shape and really finish it nicely. And that's a lot of what, what I've said earlier about just communication works just as well here. Um, lots of information about the dance that's coming up. Give the band the name of the dance. A lot of bands will have played for it before and will know what music works, what doesn't, maybe have a preferred set for it. If it's an unfamiliar dance, I'll, I, as a musician, will probably ask for more details or just steal the calling card for a while, photograph it if it's a good dance and work out what I think is from our set's going to work, probably play a bit of it back to the caller. Um, a good band will look to play emphasis to complement the steps and rise and fall of a dance. Um, help them find it by showing where the rise and falls are. An extra minute spent getting this right before the dance is called will make a world of difference. If it's a waltz, let's find the right waltz and the right feel for it. You know, my band that I regularly play and I've got four different waltz sets and they've got really different feels and potentials and emphases um, and yeah perhaps the big difference with earlier when you're dealing with an inexperienced band against an experienced band is a bit more trust with a good band you get it show them the shape of the dance and trust them to match up with it um, yeah it's all about communication and it, it's such a we've said it many times before all of us but it's that triangle of communication where the band are working with the caller they're working with the dancers the dancers are work the whole thing's working this beautiful triangle with with great communication in, in every direction and last thing to say uh, long term i just thinking beyond one kaylee i i, I think one of the ways in which callers have, um, have really shaped how I am as a musician is long-term relationships with callers like Rodri Davis or Victoria Yeomans working with these people over many years has been incredibly beneficial because if you keep doing these gigs, you really get to know each other, develop a good understanding of each other's strengths, and you can select material and ways of playing that really complement each other's works. It's really great to build up a sense of what works really well with a particular band or caller and not only return to it, but use that as a basis to plan new things. I'll highlight Rodri in particular simply because I've worked with him for so long nearly 20 years, has pushed my band to embrace a huge amount of new music a bit at a time and frankly has had a very considerable hand in shaping the repertoire and style of the band despite not actually being a member of it. And similarly, I, I did about four different sets of gigs with Victoria Yeomans during last spring and the cumulative effect of just keep working together and prepping new material meant by the end of it we just have this fabulous understanding and we're really pushing each other to, to take the music and dance into exciting new places. So I've tried to address this topic as best I can. Um, I'm aware that there will be limitations in my perspective as a white heterosexual man, there'll be things I've never needed to address because of my privilege. So I'm hoping some of those things that perhaps other people will have encountered that are relevant to this that I haven't encountered will emerge during the question and answer session and I'll be really interested to hear. Um, but I've tried to do two things, to troubleshoot how to deal with a band that perhaps aren't very good or experienced at playing for dance yet and how to work with them to help them improve should they wish to. Uh, and craft a good night, but also to look at it from my perspective as a pretty experienced musician these days. So troubleshooting those things that can sometimes frustrate us and just stop us from achieving the really good night of dance that we all uh, hopefully want. Um, I hope it's been useful. And I know for some people here, I've been teaching you to uh, suck a, a succession of eggs, but I hope there's been one or two new and interesting ideas. Um, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to Lisa for organising it all. It's all good fun. And it makes me think, and I'm my, my big payoff is I've no doubt that you're going to have lots of really interesting points and questions that I'll be able to fit into my own practice as well, things I haven't thought of. So I'm excited at that. I'm really looking forward to the question and answer, but thank you very much.